I really believe in my soul that there are 7 billion people on this planet, me included, walking around with some form of dormant creative capacity. And if we could unlock it, not only does it drive our businesses, and especially in these highly competitive and volatile times, but it also helps us unlock and solve problems that matter to us all. Welcome to Beyond Speaking with Brian Lord, a podcast featuring deeper conversations with the world's top speakers. Josh is a serial entrepreneur. He's kind of a godfather among speakers in the U.S. and Canada. He's not afraid to embrace embrace his competitors. He likes to celebrate failure, which is interesting. And he's a pretty mean jazz musician. So, Josh, thank you for joining us. It's so great to be with you. Thank you. I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but how has innovation changed in a post-COVID world or has it changed? Yeah, great question. I think it's really accelerated. And so what's happening is that with the volatility in the world in general, and you have geopolitical turmoil, and you've got war in the Ukraine, and, and, and obviously coming out of COVID, the one thing that we've learned for sure is that we can no longer simply rely on the models of the past and expect the same results. So I think to a degree, it's forced us to confront our previously held assumptions and, and re, retool, rethink the way that we think and act and, and proceed as business leaders. So I think it's been disruptive in a negative way, obviously, but, but it's also been disruptive in a positive way because we're letting go of what worked in 1973 and really focusing on what's right for today in the current set of circumstances. Yeah, one of the things I like, so you wrote the book, uh, Big Little Breakthroughs, and um, one of the stories you talk about there is gap burning down, like a gap facility burning down. And there's not just one stage of massive change, but two. So there was like, hey, here's what we have to do today, like the emergency response. But then there's the bigger thing of taking advantage of it long term. So I almost think of it like that way. You kind of had the emergency response of COVID, like 2020, part of 2021. And now you've got that, hey, what can we do now that some things have burned down or changed completely? What are how can leaders, you know, adapt their mindset to that? Well, you're exactly right. Sometimes the, these, you know, a forest fire isn't pleasant in the in the in the near term, but it does create room for something new. It allows you to rethink and, and, and really retool what's yet ahead. You know, I think there's a few things that leaders can do today. Um, one of them is is take a look and, and say, okay, if we were in a situation where we had to hit reset, hopefully your building hasn't burned down. But if it did, what might you do differently? And one fun little mental trick that I, I use often, Brian. So I um, I was building a company. I, I as you know, I started, built, and sold five tech companies, created about ten thousand jobs in the process. But at one point in my company, we were so far ahead of the competition, which was great. But I was worried that we were going to get le- uh, we lose our our urgency and our creativity. So because we didn't have a really evil arch enemy, I made one up. I made up a fake company called the Slither Corporation. And Slither was our ideal enemy. They never had a bad quarter. They're always one step ahead of us, a little faster, a little more innovative. And we started doing things like, hey, how do you think the folks at Slither solve this problem? You know, I'd say, hey, we need, to, we need to reduce our cycle time by two days. Everyone might clam up because they don't want to say the wrong thing, be embarrassed, et cetera. But if I say, hey, our spies at Slither just got a report that they shaved two days out of their production time, how do you think the folks at Slither did it? Well, now your political uh, cloudiness is gone and, and, and your whiteboards are filled with ideas. So I don't mean to be glib. I understand that we all have real world competitors, but if you just do this little mental trick, if there was an ideal competitor opened up down the block trying to take you down, what might they do differently? And that little mental exercise is actually a really powerful way to unlock fresh thinking. How do you build that out of your day or like build that into your day, I should say? Like what percentage of time did you do to actually fulfilling orders, doing kind of all the basics of business and then this portion to actually carve out time to do free thinking? Well, it's a good question. You know, see, so think about an investment portfolio. You know, many of us are saving for retirement or whatever, and you would never put all your money in one stock or even in one asset class. You'd have sort of a balanced approach. And I think too often we as leaders are so focused on delivering near-term results that we spend 100% of our time doing what I would describe as heads down work, where you're, you know, you're cranking out your deliverables, you're getting your to-do list done. But the problem by definition is when you're heads down, you're not heads up. And that heads up time is when you really do get to rethink and reboot, when you get to let your imagination run a little bit and and invent. And my suggestion is this, don't go crazy. Don't don't just forego your responsibilities, but rather allocate a little bit of time. I've issued this challenge all around the world. In fact, a 5% challenge for 30 days. Here's how it works. 5% of 40 hours is two hours a week. I know we all work more than 40, but you know, bear with me. So, So you take two hours a week and it doesn't have to be one, two hour block. It could be four 30 minute blocks but you schedule it as if it's an important meeting that can't be uh, messed with. 
And during that time, you actually allow yourself to be heads up, to noodle, to explore, to, to brainstorm, to imagine your ideal enemy. And, and here's what I hear back. So again, 30 days, it's a light lift. It's not too scary. It's a finite ending to it. So here's what I hear back. First of all, a 0% drop in productivity, zero. Magically, 40 hours gets smushed into 38 hours. No one misses a beat. Then I hear back that the first week, it feels like you're being frivolous. Like you don't want to get caught. It's almost like you're cheating on your spouse. Well, how can I be doing this heads up work? Shouldn't I be cranking out the, the today to-do list? But here's what I hear back by the end of it. People report back. They say, you know what? Once I got in the group, it became the most productive professional time I've spent in decades. And I've issued this challenge to thousands of people around the globe. And many people have carried forward with it. Again, allocating a small fixed amount of time and allowing yourself to do the hard but inspiring work of creative thinking and you know, inventiveness. And, and that's what really drives long-term sustainable success even more than just cranking out the work. So this uh, 5% rule, I know you've kind of gone back and forth. Like you talk about um, you know, when ideas are birthed, it's really messy and you go back and forth. Where did you come up with this idea and what are the iterations you went through to find kind of this perfect 5%? You know, I don't know if 5% is exactly right for everybody. It kind of works for me. You know, so it, I'd rather someone spend 2% than 0%. And of course, if you have a little more than five, that's okay too. But generally speaking, you know, if we can, if we can get most, uh, most people need to be responsible. Like we can't ignore client demands. We can't, you know, we got to keep pay the bills and keep the lights on. So the notion of 5% seems manageable for most people. And actually I write about it in the book. There's a great company in New York. It's a five-star restaurant called uh, uh, 11 Madison Park very exclusive, very expensive restaurant. And they invest 5% of their resources, which they call, they say, we invest it foolishly, quote unquote. And what they say is they say, we spend 95% of our resources. And we deploy them with Terminator-like efficiency. We dial it in. We were really you know, intense such that we can spend 5%, quote unquote, foolishly. And what they do is they, is they have a full-time small team called the Dream Weavers, who are responsible for neither delivering and making food nor doing business matters. Their entire job is to create these over-the-top, unexpected experiences for their guests, which makes a meal from good to transcendent. And so this notion of 5% available time to, to invest feels kind of right. But again, I would encourage people to start with whatever's comfortable for you, and then you can obviously build into it as you go. So I'm curious, where did this, uh, just not so much these particular things, but this uh, focus on innovation and creativity, were you like in kindergarten, you're just painting all over the place. I know like sometimes you send out people gifts of like Legos and that sort of thing. So you've got this, you're this business guy who's got this childlike quality to, to the innovation. Where did that come from for you? So Ryan, as you know, I started my career playing jazz guitar. I still play, I've been playing for over 40 years. I just love jazz music. Whether you like listening to it or not is a different story, but it's this really dangerous art form. Like only 1% of the notes are on the written page and the rest you have to improvise as you go. It's sort of like real-time innovation. And, and I've always been inspired by that. And, and I've had some wonderful success in business. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is luck. I'm, I'm pretty bad at many things, but I've always been pretty good at creativity. And what I realized in studying human creativity, which again is a deep passion of mine, is that all of us are creative. It's really sad because as high as 98% of adults don't identify as a creative person because they don't do something classically creative, like paint on canvas or do interpretive dance. But the truth is, and the research is crystal clear that as human beings, we're hardwired to be creative. That's our natural state. Your creativity might show up in the way that you manage a meeting planner and help, help them figure out the ideal programming for their event or the way you interview a new job candidate. So we can express our creativity in different ways, but there's room for creativity in every box on the org chart. And so my passion for it came from this notion that I really believe in my soul that there are 7 billion people on this planet, me included, walking around with some form of dormant creative capacity. And if we could unlock it, not only does it drive our businesses, and especially in these highly competitive and volatile times, but it also helps us unlock and solve problems that matter to us all. And even the big stuff from racial injustice to, to, to hunger and, and many of the other things that are plaguing us as, as a civilization. And I just feel like I'm on a bit of a mission or this, this calling really to help everyday people become everyday innovators. And when I see people's eyes light up like saucers and, and they reconnect to that childlike wonder, uh, it's not only fun and intrinsically rewarding, it drives better business outcomes. So it's just a cool thing all around. And as you can tell, I'm very passionate about it. 
Yeah, definitely. And I know you've done jazz sometimes. I would love it if you could work interpretive dance into some of your uh, presentations. I think that would be <laughs> that would sell that move a lot of product right there. That would be that'd be nice to have. Not uh, the way I dance, to be clear. Not the way I dance. <laughs> but you know, but kidding aside, I think that sometimes you know someone says, "Oh, well, I can't paint, so therefore I'm not creative," and that, that breaks my heart a little bit because really we are all creative. We just got to find the way that we can express that creativity. Yeah. How do you how do you advise people to do that, to break out of that and find where they're creative? Well, there's almost like remember when you were a kid that, that I'm getting hotter, I'm getting colder game. And, and to a degree that that sort of works for us as adults, too. You know, you might find that, you know, your great greatest gift of creativity is serving clients and, and, and helping them figure things out or problem solve. Someone else might be really creative in finance. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying they're cooking the books, of course not, but they might be able to interpret data in a smart way or find the, the hidden meaning in between the lines on a balance sheet. So I think that when, when your heart is telling you that, that you're in the zone, when you're feeling yourself kind of losing track of time, when you're excited and energized, those are all good indicators that you're onto a spot that your natural creativity lives. That being said, creativity is a learnable skill. And this is kind of mind blowing for many people because they think that creativity is something that you're born with. As if one of a thousand of us are born a certain way and the rest of us, we have to suffer. I like to say creativity is much more like your weight than your height. You know me, we've been together for many meals and I, I'm short, like I'm 5'5 five, five on a good day. So I can't, much as try as I may, I'm not going to be 6'3 next week. But my weight, I can control based on diet and nutrition and such. That's exactly like your creativity. It doesn't matter what you were born with. What matters is how do you cultivate and develop those skills? You just shared with me that you're learning Romanian, like one of your many languages, and you can learn a new language. In the same way, we can learn as human beings to be more creative. And because it's a natural part of us, it actually is a skill that can be learned pretty easily. So what's your process? So I know you talked about that. That's one of the things in your book is um, uh, building the muscle. So and I like that as a way of, of talking about it, too. I know you're, you're a pretty fit guy there. What are how would you do that? Apply that sort of gym mentality to creativity? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, just like if you are on a, a, a fitness commitment, you know, it's more about consistency. Like if you just went and worked out really hard for one day and then blew it off for six months, you're not going to be super fit. But if you if you train regularly, that will help, you know, kind of build the muscle, so to speak. So I think as leaders, it's a commitment to prioritizing this, which, by the way, you know, th this used to be thought of as a soft skill. But today, with most things being automated and commoditized and outsourced, Creativity, I believe, is one of the most important competitive advantages that can be cultivated. Helps us win the talent more, helps us keep our customers, et cetera. So I think it's important to acknowledge that and then, and then devote some resources to building the muscle. But just like I learned to play guitar, and, and, and I know you're, you've learned a bunch of things, including, uh, including new languages, it, it's about doing the reps. And it doesn't mean you have to, to you know, hurt, be in pain. Creativity is fun. But even something as simple as five minutes a day of deliberate practice can go a very long way to, to cultivating these creative skills. The other thing I'll say is that there are some habits, but there's also some mindsets and tactics that can be used. I write a lot in the book that brainstorming, the technique that most of us use to generate ideas, is one of the most ineffective and outdated techniques on the planet. It was invented in 1958. I'm sorry, a lot of things have changed since 1958. True. And so there's just simply better techniques that can do a much better job of bringing your creativity to the surface. So with a little bit of deliberate practice and a little bit of an upgrade of technique, we're able to unlock very quickly a big boost in creative output. I always like to put speakers on the spot. So what are your what are some of yours that you use? Your that your daily building that you have for creativity, innovation, or, or whatever else, whatever else you want to share. Yeah, so uh, one, one thing I do, I literally spend two minutes a day, and it's gonna take me more than two minutes to explain what I do, but I, I divide it into two one minute blocks. And this is my like my jumping jacks for creativity. First minute, I bathe in the creativity of others. I might read a poem out loud or listen to some music or, or stare at a painting. And they always say in, in, in software engineering, if you wanna change the outputs, you gotta first change the inputs. So I literally spend one minute only absorbing the inputs of others, and it kind of stokes my creative fire. Next minute, one minute sprint, I do an unrelated challenge. So for example, I don't live in Atlanta and I'm not in charge of traffic, but I might say, huh, I know there's a lot of traffic in Atlanta. What's something that I could do to help improve that situation? Now, to be clear, I'm not trying to solve it with one silver bullet. When you put that type of pressure on yourself, rarely will you find an answer. So instead I say, how many small ideas can I come up with in that one minute sprint that might help improve traffic in Atlanta? So by taking on a problem that has nothing to do with me personally, grab something from the news, any news feed that you want, you're actually, again, you're, you're building the muscle, you're doing jumping jacks. 
If you do that two minute exercise for 30 days in a row, you will be blown away at the boost in your creative abilities. Now you're a parent as well. And what are the, what are these lessons that you teach your kids? Are they doing these two minute sprints in the morning or is there, obviously you've got kids of different ages, you know, five and a half year old twins are going to be taught something different than older kids, but what, uh, how do you teach them to develop their innovation and creativity? Well, we've talked about this many times, right? I have four kids, uh, two older ones and the five-year-old twins. I've always tried to give them open-ended questions. As instead of saying, is it a, you know, a multiple choice, more open-ended. And I like giving them these scenarios like, what if? So I might grab a pen and say to my son, Noah, who's now 24, hey, if we had to market this in, in the world and, and create an ad campaign, but we couldn't use it for writing, what else could we do? What, what are the alternative uses for this pen? Or uh, how would you go about solving this problem if you had 50% of the time and 50% of the resources? So I just give them like these little probes and little creative challenges to help them realize there's multiple ways to solve a problem. And sometimes the best answers are the least obvious answers. And with the five-year-olds, I think it's also about really, really prioritizing their creative risk-taking. I would rather them take a risk when they're making a painting and screw something up than, than, than berating them for not getting it perfect. You know. So I think as parents, well-intentioned parents, Sometimes we teach our kids there's only one right answer and whatever you do, don't make a mistake. But I think in the real world, that can really backfire. Mm -hmm. Rather than rote memorization, I think we need to teach our kids creative problem solving and inventive thinking in order to meet the challenges that they will face going forward. I really like to like talking about failure. I know you use the example of, you know, uh, I think it's Google uh, has like their wall of fame failures type of thing. Um, how do you celebrate failure as a business owner? Well, there's a number of ways. And I think as a, as a leader, the best thing we can do is, is to create rituals and rewards that support the creative process. And so in other words, if you have a sign in your lobby that says, go be innovative, and then someone shops, shows up with a half-baked idea and you send them to corporate timeout, like you've just trained them to never share another good idea again. So the best leaders create these little rituals and rewards that support responsible risk-taking. Here's an example I write about in the book. One of the innovators that I interviewed is a guy named um, uh, Trellin Resterick. He lives in London. He's got this really cool company. It's not a huge company, but every Friday they have F up Fridays. <laughs> they, they say the whole word. I'll just be polite here, but here's what F up Fridays are. They have a big brown bag lunch for the whole company. And one by one, each person has to stand up and proudly share what they F'd up that week and what they learned from it. Inevitably, they get to someone that didn't F something up and everyone's like, well, why not? What are you going to try next week? <laughs> And so just think for a minute about what the zero cost ritual does. It tells the message that, hey, everybody in our company is an innovator, that we know some ideas will work and some won't, and that's okay. We got your back. That we are encouraging you to take responsible risks, not run from them. And we can stand up proudly and you have the support of your peers and bosses alike. So whether you embrace that or something like it, I think the notion of, as leaders, here's the problem, fear. Fear is the biggest blocker of creative output, not natural talent, fear. And simply put, fear and creativity cannot coexist. So in this example, this leader created a simple ritual that removed the fear and in turn liberated the creativity. Yeah, and I like that too, just kind of the switch of the mindset of, and, and you actually beat me to the next question, um, with, with his story with the, uh, the cigarette voting machines, like you know, dealing with so much in the nonprofit world, not all of them, but a lot of nonprofits use guilt to change behaviors. Like that's the number one thing. Can you share the story of using humor or I don't know if humor, but fun might be the right word for it. Sure. Yeah. It turns out that in central London, cigarette butt litter is the single biggest environmental challenge. And in fact, in many large cities around the world, and it's one of those pesky problems. People keep trying to throw money at it. Not much success. So this person I just mentioned, Trellin, same, same guy. Um, I, I found him. He was really not a celebrity. He's not a billionaire. He's a normal dude. But he saw this problem and decided to do something about it. So he invented something called the ballot bin, which basically encourages smokers to vote with their butts. Of course, I mean their cigarette butts. Here's how it works. He created this thing, this ballot bin. It's, it's a bright yellow painted metal box with a glass front. At the top of the box is a two-part question, such as, which is your favorite food, pizza or hamburgers? And there's these little receptacles where you stick your cigarette butts in. Now there's a divider. So when you put your cigarette butt, for example, in one of those slots, it falls on top of the other cigarette butts and it's almost like you have an instant bar chart. You can see who's in the lead. And this, this can be customized in any two-part question. You can say, you know, what's your favorite sports team or which singer do you like best? Some are more humorous. I saw one that said Trump's hair. 
real or fake, <laughs> not political, just funny, not a political statement. But anyway, the, the idea here is that um, the simple low tech solution that didn't require a billion dollars of capital and it didn't require regulatory approval or 13 PhDs, it worked. And when ballot bins are installed, they reduce cigarette litter by 80%. Hmm. Trevin went on to start this company. He's now in 27 countries around the world, making a meaningful impact. And, and Brian, the reason I love that story is that it's not only cool, but, but to me, when I see Elon Musk launching a rocket ship, I'm like, good for Elon Musk, but it's hard to see ourselves as the next Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. But when I see what Trellin did, I think we can all agree that any one of us could come up with that idea. And frankly, all of us have ideas like that floating around. So to me, it's much more encouraging because it makes it feel much more inclusive and accessible. The whole notion of that Big Little Breakthroughs book that I wrote is around taking small baby steps, micro innovations, daily acts of creativity that add up to big things. They're way less risky than their swing for the fences, uh, moonshot counterparts. They're way more accessible. And like Trevin, you can do some really great stuff when we just let those little acts of creativity shine. I love it. I love it. Well, Josh, thank you so much uh, for, you know, for sharing these ideas and, uh, you know, being who you are in the industry, I, I know we didn't quite get to it, but uh, you're one of the most influential speakers amongst speakers out there. Um, you're also the host of the Mic Drop podcast. So definitely check that one out. It's much cooler than this one, except when Josh is on this one. So uh, anyway, Josh, thank you so much for joining us here on the Beyond Speaking podcast. Well, Brian, thanks so much. And thanks for the great work you're doing and continue to do to lead our industry forward. It's really a Always a pleasure chatting with you, and uh, I, I can't, can't express enough gratitude for our friendship and partnership. Thank you for joining us for the Beyond Speaking podcast. To learn more about today's guests, go to beyondspeak.com. Make sure to leave a review and subscribe wherever you listen.